Uh, particulates are little stuff. Um, a particle. Um, and you know, most, most pollution is like of a known chemical composition, but it still has mass, right? Like, um, you can know what H2O is, but then you still got to figure out whether that H2O is in a um, solid form or a liquid form or a vapor form. Um, so most of the air pollutants that I've talked about can occur as particulates. You can have a thing that has sulfur dioxide, or you can have sulfur dioxide gas. Um, little stuff is especially dangerous, I keep saying this, because it can get parked into your lungs. It can uh, have extended contact time. So you get more time for chemistry to happen and that affects you more. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's important to know that particulates um, are natural and they're common in our environment. Um, but humans make more of them by burning stuff. Um, we also make more by like driving in dirt roads and causing exposed topsoil. Um, usually we measure how many pieces are suspended in the air. So like sometimes you'll notice that I'm like waving away little pieces of lint in my man cave, cause like I'll sweep or something and just kick up some dust. You've seen this, um, those particles, if the air is moving will be suspended and then those particulates will eventually settle. So you measure particulates by how many are in suspension, how many are moving around in the air. Um, and in this case, size really matters. Uh, particulate material is, um, uh, classified by its size. So there's PM10, PM2.5, and uh, ultra PM. Um, and fun detail, the, the units of measurement are different. So um, PM10 is average size 10. I think it's picometers but PM 2.5 is 2.5 microns. So it's not like PM 2.5 is a quarter of PM 10. Uh, PM 2.5 is one four thousandth of PM 10, right? It's like a log scale, like it's, it's measured in different units. So PM 2.5 is way smaller. PM 10 is something you can see with the naked eye. Um, and because it's so big, it's less dangerous um, because your body filters that sort of stuff. Most natural particulate material is PM10. So yes, it can still be harmful. Yes, you should still avoid it. But for the most part, we have evolved in the presence of natural particulates so when humans add particulates that are about the size of natural ones, your body has to work harder, but your body's evolved to deal with that stuff. You've got a filter. Uh, you've got nose hairs, you've got um, mucus lining all of your respiratory system, and you've got ciliated tissues. There's cells that have these little conveyor belts that move the mucus uphill. So as stuff goes down, it reaches fresher and fresher and fresher and stickier and stickier mucus all the way down. And so I'm sorry if that's a gross thing for you to think about, but it's kind of awesome that your body has this like counter current filtration medium moving upward as your air is moving inward so that you can clean particulates from reaching your lungs. Stuff like pollen, dust, soot, smoke, big ashes. Um, most of that doesn't really reach your lungs. It's very contained. Um, boogers are a bunch of particulates that your body is dumping back out. So your suspended particulates try to go in, they catch onto the mucus, the mucus dries and dries and dries and dries, and then falls out of your nose or you throw it at your little sister or maybe you eat it to improve your immune system. 
I had a booger fall out of my nose when I was in bed. I was like, oh, dang. And I lost a booger. And then I didn't want to sleep on that part of my bed anymore. And I was like, oh, where's this booger? And I couldn't find it. And I was like shaking off my sheets. And my wife's like, what the hell are you doing? And I was like, I dropped a booger. <laughs> you probably didn't need to hear that. Sorry. This is what happened when I don't sleep. Um, PM 2.5. Uh, is fine. It's usually too fine to get caught by hairs and it's so fine that it can stay in suspension so it doesn't stick to the mucus in your respiratory system. It just stays in the air because it's so light it doesn't take a lot of air movement. So those do get into your lungs um, and that allows the extended contact time. Uh, that, that helps um, the chemistry happen in that layer of water in your bronchioles, um, inside your lungs. And so that chemistry does affect your bloodstream. Um, the, the big one here is fine ashes. Like when you burn fossil fuels and there's like some bit of chemistry that doesn't burn well in complete combustion or impurities in combustion. Um, and so remember that if you're burning just carbon the carbon will get stuck to oxygen and that'll be a gas and there's not a lot of stuff left over and that co2 is just something that moves in and out of your lungs and your body's used to handling that and carbon dioxide is usually not a problem but also remember that fossil fuels are made out of the whole fossil and um, when you're compressing a whole bunch of biomass other bits of other elements can be bonded to the carbon. Those are the impurities um, in fossil fuels. Uh, there could be metals, there could be nitrogen, there could be sulfur, um, there could be all the other elements of the periodic table in fossil fuels. And so when you're burning the fossil fuels and the carbon bonds are broken, you might also stick oxygen onto other things that are disconnected from the carbon. And those other things, they might not burn completely. You might have like little bits of soot um, or ashes. And so the PM 2.5 is very specifically tied to fossil fuels and not just fossil fuels in general, but impure fossil fuels. So the particular fossil fuels matter Natural gas has less impurities, so natural gas makes less of these. Like I told you that some people are excited about natural gas because it can be cleaner. Well, this is how it's cleaner. Natural gas does not hold the sulfur, the nitrogen, the heavy metals, those other hydrocarbons um, that are common in gasoline, in dirty gasoline, in inefficient or low regulated cars. So um, the more impurities, usually the more fine particulates. And ultra fine particulates are kind of new. This was considered nut job science about 20 years ago, and it's become much more accepted, but still not extremely well studied. Um, Ultrafine particulates are so fine that they literally squeeze between cells. These are much smaller than the, um, than the cells of your respiratory system. So these can just kind of like sneak directly into the blood. Um, and there's not a lot of stuff that makes ultrafine particulates. Some weird industrial processes that I didn't list here, but there are ultrafine particulates found in tobacco smoke and um, some types of fossil fuels. Um, you should probably know that they exist, but I don't know much more to teach you about ultrafine particulates. Um, most of the... Uh, symptoms I keep listing uh, are caused by particulates too. Um, it's interesting to see the patterns though. So the respiratory stuff, asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, uh, pneumonia, um, and then all the circulatory stuff, the high blood pressure, the heart attacks, the strokes, um, and of course changes to the chemistry of your DNA which can lead to cancer. Um, 
um, particulates have the same secondary chemistry that you've seen somewhere else. So particulates and car emissions would be the photochemical smog stuff, which is the oxidants, particulates in um, coal emissions would be sulfur oxides, which are the same acids that you saw in um, sulfurous gray smog. Um, some of us can afford more air pollution than others. Um, children have a weird body size ratio thing where children um, use like all of their lungs all of the time. They don't have like backup lung capacity, whereas adults usually have disproportionately large lungs. So adults use a bit of their lungs, but if an adult has to outrun a lion, they can kick it into gear and use the rest of the lungs. Kids tend to run in that high gear all the time. So for children, particulate air pollution is especially dangerous because they don't have any like extra lung capacity to pull in. Um, also the elderly, because they've already compromised some of their lung function through aging. Um, and a lot of people who already have asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, elevated blood pressure, heart attacks, or stroke, they can just, they're already on the edge, so they're much more likely to be triggered. Um, it's important to note that the poor are much more likely to encounter particulate pollution. Uh, if you're wealthy, you can pick where you live. Wealthy people all live in nice places because they can afford to, but the poor can't. Uh, um, and so if you're going to build a power plant, I'm not going to build it in Montecito where the neighbors are all going to sue me. I'm going to build it where all the poor people live because they don't matter, politically speaking. Harsh reality, I know. That's not actually how I feel personally, but that explains the logic of why the poor um, face particulates much more than others. And remember that in some countries minorities are more likely to be poor. And so there's a uh, distinct color line, for example, in the US with um, who is hospitalized for health uh, reasons that are tied to particulate material. Uh, in the US, black and brown kids are way more likely um, to be made sick by particulates. Um, it's important also to know that smokers have a broken filter. Fun fact, the chemistry of nicotine paralyzes the conveyor belt. Smokers don't move mucus uphill after they've had their first cigarette of the day. Smokers, I think I've mentioned this before, when they have their first cigarette of the day, their cilia stop moving and the mucus doesn't go uphill, it just loads up in the bottom of their respiratory tract. That's why smokers cough is a thing. In the morning, they hawk up all that mucus. So smokers don't filter the particulates. That's a big whoop. Because if you smoke and you live in a city, that explains some of the extreme mortality of smokers. It's not actually the tobacco smoke itself that sickens smokers. But tobacco smoke not only is toxic in and of itself, but you know, like if you're a smoker here in Santa Barbara, you're less likely to die of lung problems than if you're a smoker in a city because smoking makes you more susceptible to particulates reaching your lungs. Um, imagine that you're in Beijing. Now that you've heard all these descriptions, Beijing has all of it. The gray smog, the brown smog, exceptionally high particulate um, material pollution. By the way, they also have natural particulate um, material pollution. They have tons of the air toxins that I told you to use your book. Um, and they have a bunch of people who smoke. Um, it's horrifying the implications of the development um, of Beijing. Um, um, remember that in developed nations, you can regulate people's behavior because you can afford to put attention and money into regulation. Kuznets curve. Um, so in big cities in the United States, 
like San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York, um, we're kind of cracking down on most of the cars and we're cracking down on most of the factories. So our big cities aren't that bad, but big cities in less developed countries, um, that is the deadliest pollution on earth, we think. Um, of all the ways that humans are killing each other with their actions, um, the, the deadliest of the pollution is air quality in big cities in developing countries. Um, like that city that I couldn't remember in Uzbekistan. Um, by the way, Beijing is figuring it out. Um, Beijing is starting to implement uh, air pollution controls now. Okay, I'll stop.